this position from Bill. And uh, when I came to interview at Penn State, I found out that um, Bill is friends with uh, my mentor, Henry Drool. And so I reached out to, um, to Henry and told him that we were doing this seminar to celebrate Bill's work. And Henry told me um, a great story about a wonderful exhibit on headrests, which Bill curated entitled Sleeping Beauties um, at the Fowler Museum in, at UCLA. And so also in Henry's own words, he said, we were, we were all, Bill, Barbara, and me in LA at the Fowler Museum and spending time with the director, Dor Doran Ross, who was renowned for his prodigious energy, love of life, and capacity to enjoy good food and strong drink. After the program, he invited us to join him at one of his favorite restaurants where the food just kept coming and liquid refreshments began to flow. <laughs> Compared to Duran, we three were lightweights. And when it, when it came to drinking and before long, we were raising a ruckus, talking and laughing and getting very silly. <laughs> and so the afternoon, notice this is the afternoon, <laughs> turned into early evening and would have continued until we realized we were about to miss our flights home. The rest is a blur, but we made it to the airport just in time, laughing all the way. It was a memorable time. Although my memory of the event may be as blurred as my mind on that day. And he sends you a message, Bill. He says, happy retriment. Okay, <laughs> not retirement, okay? Retirement. All right, and say, say once from your once upon a time drinking buddy, Hank, okay? <laughs> Tell him thank you. <laughs> okay, I shall definitely give, send the message, okay? Now, it was, a, some, it was yeah? a favorite of Doran's um, called Cafe Katsu. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember that time. Well, I remember that part. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you may know Bill's history, that he grew up on the continent in uh, what was once known as Rhodesia from the age of six to 15. His parents were United Methodist teachers. His mother studied the Shona language and culture. And so Bill became exposed to all kinds of art and learned an appreciation of African language and culture from early on. Now his wife, Barbara, gave me a fun fact to share that he is both a queen scout on the British side and an Eagle Scout. And any one of us who spent time with Bill knows that the tradition of service from the scouts has never left him as he is always helpful. Now he went to the University of Minnesota where he received a scholarship to do an exchange program in Nigeria at the University of Lagos and where he was the only American and maybe the only exchange student and he was immediately drafted into the basketball team. And of course, you know, maybe being American and tall, that may be the next logical step, okay? But of course, he never played basketball. Um, he traveled all over the country with the team. However, the time in Nigeria shaped his desire to study African art. He's, Ekpo Eko was the director of the National Museum and he, was, he also lectured at the university and he arranged for Bill to volunteer at the museum. Also, when Bill returned to the, you know, the United States to do his MPhil student, his, his, I'm saying MPhil, his MA thesis, he studied under Frank Willett at, the North, at Northwestern University. Now, North, you know, I have to say, you have to understand who these two gentlemen are, Ekpo Ekpo Eyo and Frank Willett, are the beginnings of the study of African art history on the African side, Nigeria, and on the Western side. So he was mentored by two of the greatest art historians, you know, that we could speak of in the last century and into this one. Now, Bill has many credits to his name and in, for, in lieu of time, I'll just list some of, some of his exhi exhibitions. Africa celebrates the art of living. The world moves, we follow celebrating African art. 
Legacies of Stone, Zimbabwe Past and Present, Course Sleeping Beauties, Striking Iron, The Art of African Blacksmiths, Fatal Beauty, Traditional Weapons of Central Af Africa, and of course, his recent um, curation of African bil brilliance for the Palmer exhibit. And his own published work, you know, his work on Zimbabwean metal and stone arts are one of some of the most amazing contributions to the field. Now we have a plaque to give to Bill to celebrate his three years of service as the director of African studies. And I think I'll call Nalima, can you hold up, you know, like our plaque for him that you can't really see, you know? Somehow we'll find a way, Bill, to disinfect and pass to you during this era of COVID, okay? But just, we just want to say thank you so much for directing the program and for bringing it to the point that I could take over. And I also want to give a personal thank you because you made it so much easier for me to transit into this role and also to answer all my questions, which I still call and you know email and ask you you know, to help me and to guide me as I move along. You know. Now, Nalima will be our MC, and but before I turn it over to her, in the, you know, I'll just do a quick sum of our lineup. You know, right after we will have Elizabeth Cassie Mansfield, who's the head of art history, and that is Bill's former boss. Okay. And from African studies, we'll have represented um, Professor Sinfri Maconi, who's an as associate professor in African studies and in um, applied linguistics. Then we'll have Nalima um, J. Chandran, who was a postdoc under Bill and is now a visiting faculty professor in African studies and in Asian studies. For our external speakers, we'll ha have Sandra Klopper, okay, who's a professor emerita at Cape Town University who will speak about um, Bill's collaborative work with art institutions in Southern Africa. Of course, we'll have Dele Jegede, Professor Emeritus at Miami University, who will focus on artistic mediations and long-term engagements with artists showcasing their works. Um, we'll have Janet Purdy, uh, Daniel F. and Ada L. Rice, postdoctoral fellow in African art at the Art Institute, Institute of Chicago and a former student of Bill's who will focus on Bill's pedag pedagogical um, contributions. And um, to some, Al Roberts, who's a distinguished professor at UCLA, Department of World Arts and Cultures, who will touch on um, the exhib exhibitions that they've both, both worked on and uh, some of their major projects, okay? So I will then um, ask Cassie, okay, to come forward in this chain of, uh, our, in our Zoom chain, and then um, have Nalima take over the program. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words about um, Bill's work in art history, the contributions he's made to uh, the Department of Art History, really in, in so many ways and at so many different levels. Um, you know, as a professor of art history, as a advisor to uh, art history undergraduates and graduate students, um, several of whom are with us here today, which is great to see. And of course, also as a mentor and not only to, to his students, but uh, really to, to many of us. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, invitation. Thank you, Cheryl. And, so I think what I'll do is, is just start with uh, Bill, what he's done as a professor um, in, in our department. Bill's, as you've already heard about his background from Cheryl, his breadth, his range as a, a scholar and as a teacher has been um, enormously you know, kind of transformative to our curriculum because Bill has uh, brought courses on ancient art of Africa, uh, art of Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and of course also the African diaspora. Uh, so he's been teaching in, in all of these uh, areas in the department. Um, and this, I think very importantly, and especially here at Penn State, Bill's classes on African art have allowed 
thousands of our students to experience forms of cultural expression that really would otherwise not be accessible to them. Uh, and Bill has done this. And, and as many of you know, Bill includes in his lectures documentary photographs and also recordings, uh, his own photographs, his own recordings that he's made on site so that his students are seeing you know, works of art, uh, performances in their own original context. This is, I think, really a key contribution of Bill's teaching. And because what he's been teaching Penn State students is that art is first and foremost, record of, of relationships, of unique relationships. These are records of relationships between individuals, between artists and their environments, relationships that occur that really cross cultures, cross geographies. And Bill has imparted this approach to a generation of, of his students and advisees. And of course, among them, uh, as you know, uh, our, our alumna, uh, Janet Purdy, a graduate student specializing in the history of African art who are here today, including Alex Flanagan and Caroline Bastian. And also, uh, I really have to mention that even the graduate students who are not strictly speaking, um, focusing on African art, have been have benefited enormously from uh, Bill's mentorship, and I see uh, at least two of them here today: Claire Heidenreich and Carly Etz, who I know uh, have have worked closely with Bill, and and his influence on them I know has been a very very important one. Now, of course, the list of Bill's mentees is, uh, I think, as we'll be hearing today, a very long list. And in fact, I have to include myself among those who have been mentored um, by Bill. And from the moment I arrived at Penn State in the fall of 2018, um, Bill has been really a constant source of encouragement and counsel to me. And so I I too have been a beneficiary of, of his generosity and his wisdom. So as a, a professor, as past head of, of African studies, as past director of the Africana Research Center, as a guest curator at the Palmer a Museum of Art, you know, Bill's impact uh, and what he's kind of connected us in art history to um, is really, I think, uh, made a tremendous impact, uh, especially on our you know, connections across colleges and with, uh, with other individuals. That is to say, to be in one of the programs that uh, where Bill has worked is in fact to know the others, is to know uh, one another because of Bill's very subtle, very friendly way of bringing all of us together. And it's Bill's relationships, I think, in the wider world that have brought uh, great luminaries uh, to Penn State and to the Department of Art History, just as it is Bill's expertise and his connections that have brought new works of art to the Palmer Museum. And this has really significantly developed uh, the Palmer's collection of African art. And this legacy, the legacy of the Palmer alone, uh, promises to be continually transformative for the study of African art history at Penn State. And I think we had a glimpse of this uh, kind of transformation and this potential last year with the African Brilliance exhibition that Cheryl uh, mentioned earlier, which was organized by Bill and, and Janet, uh, and which very happily lives on today as a um, online kind of multimedia uh, companion exhibition which has uh, supplementary videos and content uh, to which many of you today uh, here contributed to, I know. And, and last of all, you know, what Bill contributed and, and continues to contribute to the Department of Art History is not only his deep expertise in the history of, of the arts of Africa, uh, but his approach to scholarship as well, which is again, collaborative and in fact, catalytic in its way. And I think the Striking Iron exhibition that Bill co-curated, uh, again, which Cheryl mentioned, 
uh, an exhibition that opened at the Fowler Museum in 2019 before traveling to the Smithsonian and then the Musée K. Branly. This exhibition was really possible uh, because of years of collaborative relationships that Bill um, built up and maintained. Uh, it was because of the trust of his fellow scholars, the trust of curators, the trust of artists, the trust of collectors that allowed uh, that exhibition and, and his scholarship to, to take place, to happen. There's something about Bill that seems to just uh, spontaneously generate that sense of community, of trust and connection. Uh, I think it's why we're all here today and what he's done for art history in terms of collegiality, collaboration um, can't be overemphasized. And so thank you on behalf of the department, Bill. Uh, we are so grateful for everything you've done uh, for us. Thanks. You're welcome and thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Mansfield and thank you, Professor Sterling. Um, I now invite Professor Sinfrey McConey from the African Studies to give the opening remarks. Professor McConey, you can take it from here. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have much to say, but let me try and have a go at it. Uh, when I received a call from Nelima to talk at Bill Jewish uh, farewell seminar a couple of weeks ago, I said yes, and like many things I agreed to nationally and internationally, did not pay much attention to the implications of my answer until a couple of days ago when the deadline began to approach. At the time I approached for this seminar, it dawned on me that since I said yes, it must surely mean, even from the perspective of a wayward linguist, that I must have something to say which people would like to listen to, which ideally and hopefully will be meaningful to Bill as well. When I looked at the program, it dawned on me that I hadn't mapped out clearly what was the angle or perspective about Bill which I was going to adopt in my short talk. I had the option of simply repeating and rephrasing what other speakers would say. And I thought, oh no, that might not be a very good thing to do. On close reflection, I realized that there was one perspective which might be enriching and not easily foregrounded by other speakers. I was going to talk about what Bill and myself have in common, other than both of us being interested in Africa. Bill is Zimbabwean and so am I. He grew up in Northeast, in, in Northeast Zimbabwe, or, or what was then called Rhodesia. It must have been called then. I did my secondary school or high school at St. Augustine's Missionary School in the Northeast of Zimbabwe as well. Bill speaks and writes Shona, one of the Bantu languages used largely in Zimbabwe, but also in the Western region of Zimbabwe, and so do I. Both of us have experiences dealing with missionaries at personal and professional level. This particular context enabled my discussions with Bill over the years to be quite enriching because we had a, a lot in common other than being in African studies. We could, so to speak, go back home and try and see what it is that we had learned from home. The common background I have with him has implications on the story which I want to talk, uh, talk about as well. My talk about him is therefore going to be about him as a Zimbabwean citizen and scholar. As a Zimbabwean myself, I'm proud that one of our own has managed in, in his career, albeit far from home, to have such a major impact on scholarship and other people's lives. As a Zimbabwean myself, I'm also proud that we're able to share him with the rest of the globe, underscoring our generosity as a people and country. Having said that, I think time has now come for Zimbabwe to demand that Bill repays us what is due. The Zimbabwean higher education system is going through rapid expansion. I'm not sure there are many art historians in the many universities or in Zimbabwe or his station. We therefore hope that now that he's no longer burdened with the day-to-day -day management of the African studies program and other more mundane issues in the world academy, you'll be able to leverage his enormous international network to develop art history back home in Zimbabwean universities. 
I'm sure this is a challenge he will carry out with the diplomacy and tact, which have become his personal hallmark. I therefore conclude by saying in the African language that me and him share in common, Tinotenda, Famba Rakanaka. Thank you very much and go well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor McConey. Um, next, I have to share a few words on the next speaker in line. And I, like Professor McConey, was thinking about what to talk and what to foreground. And I thought maybe I should share this aspect of Bill's work uh, that you know not many of you might know about. And that is also not something that is foregrounded. And this has got to do with his Indian Ocean connection and looking at African diaspora in the Indian Ocean world. And uh, many of you may not have known that, you know, Bill actually uh, was involved in this major study that took place way back in 1990. So I'm an Indian Ocean scholar who looks at African diasporic uh, communities in the Indian Ocean world and I'm also looking at Africana expressive cultures in the Indian Ocean world. So this project that took place in 1990s was actually the first major cross-continental collaborative project in which scholars, select scholars from the University of Iowa then went to actually sites in India and other parts of South Asia and Indian scholars along with them went back to Africa and did this kind of collaborative uh, ethnographic work to look at uh, Africana cultural uh, practices, uh, performances and rituals on both sides of the continent. And that work was so instrumental, but kind of less talked about when we are discussing, you know, the African Indian Ocean world uh, because it was actually way ahead of time. This was actually in the 90s when scholars was actually beginning to talk about the African Indian Ocean world, which even today is, you know, understudied in comparison to the Black Atlantic world. So Bill was one of the key persons, you know, involved in that research. And actually he had gone to many sites that I study and uh, so uh, I actually, when I came to Penn State as a postdoc, I got uh, some of his old videos that he had recorded, the VHS tapes, and I had difficulty finding a player actually. <laughs> Getting the materials was easy, but finding a VHS player was the biggest challenge. And I went and looked at his tape and it was so phenomenal to kind of look at the communities that he and actually Preeta Maya had documented. So when you actually unpack Bill's um, work in different continents, you know, uh, you see that he had done all these kinds of works, documented different, uh, you know, cultural practices, and his, uh, many of you have been to his, uh, you know, office. His office is like a library. You have to kind of go and find materials and uh, many of them are you know actually archives that we can use and hence I also kind of volunteered to help him pack because I also want to unpack his <laughs> archives and maybe take some valuable materials back home uh, <laughs> so I, it seems that uh, you know you're also getting other volunteers bill so the <laughs> other <laughs> The other aspect, again, I like to kind of foreground and share is um, Bill's involvement with the ARC here at Penn State, that is the Africana Research Center. So that was my introduction to Penn State. I came here as a postdoctoral fellow in the Africana Research Center, and I also see Nan Woodruff here. Hi, Nan, who was then also helping with the ARC. And uh, uh, Bill played a critical role in the ARC. He stepped in and, you know, he kind of um, expanded the program when, uh, you know, uh, leadership was most needed. So he was involved in not just the African studies, but also with the Africana Research Center here at Penn State. And he was my mentor for a while and helped me in many ways, but also a friend, a family, who dearly welcomed me here at Penn State. So I want to, on a very personal note, 
thank you, Bill, and also take the opportunity to thank you, Barb. So both have, both of you have been very welcoming and I don't want to take much time from our distinguished speakers who are kind of joining us from different parts of the continent. So I would kind of uh, want them to talk about Bill's Uru of work. And I would now like to invite Professor Sandra uh, Kopler from uh, Professor Emerita of University of Cape Town. And uh, Professor um, Kopler has uh, again, you know, done immense work in South Africa. She has collaborated with indigenous community. She's an art historian, but also an administrator. And for a long time, she has collaborated with Bill on multiple projects. So I invite Professor Sandra Kopler here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm slightly distracted by a very boisterous puppy. So I do apologize for that. Um, uh, and I'm not quite talking in the way that uh, you've indicated that I might, but I'm fascinated by the way that certain themes, certain senses of Bill's work have already come up that I feel very strongly about. Um, in preparing for this, I think, really important and wonderful event, um, I walked around my house looking for, I, I don't file things properly in, in bookcases. So I was scanning my bookcases for things uh, that had something to do with or were by um, Bill. And I have to say that it was an extraordinary nostalgia trip into the past uh, and a wonderful sense for me of the enormity and the breadth of Bill's achievements. The first thing that I came across was um, Bill's uh, Sleeping Beauties, the catalog that he did for the very uh, successful Fowler uh, Museum exhibition in 1993, and which of course then traveled subsequently to, to other centers. And I was thinking, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to look into the history of research on African headdress. And I think it was really one of the first significant substantial studies on that um, topic. But it's also significant, I think, in that it set the tone for beautiful titles for headdress studies. So there was Bill's Sleeping Beauties. Um, and this was followed by others like, um, African Dream Machines by Anitra Nettleton, Africa in Repose, Extensions of the Self. And I think these titles in themselves give a sense of just the richness and the complexity of that one particular form and the studies that have taken uh, place of it. But Bill, a, a pioneer, I would say, in many respects uh, in, in, in that particular field. Um, so, that, Looking further, I came across um, uh, the Staffs of Life uh, catalog, which was, of course, an exhibition that was held uh, in Iowa in 1994. And it really struck me um, how extraordinarily beautiful the cover photograph for that exhibition was. It was um, edited by Al, who is participating in this event here. I was going to say tonight, it's tonight in, in Cape Town, but of course it's midday for all of you. Um, and it, it, it's a, this most a veritable forest of iron staffs from a family shrine in, in Benin that, that is on the cover of, of that catalogue. And for me, it really was a, an amazing reminder of the richly intertwined histories in Africa of art and religion, of art and community, of the power of art to shape and transform our lives and of the utilitarian as symbolic, uh, which is so often the, the case in, in, in Africa. And I think that although a relatively slim catalog, it, it was a very important, again, if you like, even a precursor of many other things that were to come and that have already been referred to in terms of iron uh, studies uh, that have happened subsequently. Um, I then looked, carried on looking, and I found the 2003 World, Mo The World Moves We Follow. Um, and just paging through it uh, and rereading sections of it, um, I was struck by 
the incredible lucidity of those exposition of key concepts and concerns in the life experiences of African communities. But I was also struck very strongly by the dedication that, that Bill made in this catalog. And I want to read that dedication because I think it's really, really important. Um, he said, he dedicates this catalog to my family, both nuclear and extended in the United States and in Africa. And I think that really brought home to me the huge gift of interconnectedness that African art scholars have benefited from, because it is true for us. We are in many respects more like a family uh, than simply a community um, of, of scholars. And we are a family that I think is generally extremely passionate about its work and about uh, fostering lasting connections. Um, and from that, I thought about Iowa and Iowa City. Um, and I remember going there in the mid 1990s as a guest of uh, Bill's who had invited me to come and lecture there. I went subsequently with him to Wisconsin um, where I gave a lecture um, under the, that, that Henry Drewell had uh, organized. My connection to Henry, by the way, we're speaking about connections to Henry, is that he was an external examiner on my PhD thesis. So I arrive in, in, in Iowa um, and I will, I remember that, uh, a, that, that particular period hugely. I remember an evening that uh, Bill and I went to Ellen Polly to their home. It was round about um, Halloween and they were then already working on Amadou Bamba and they did a presentation for us in their living room um, of the research and the enormous granted totally appropriate excitement uh, at the discoveries around uh, that project, which of course became a very, very major publication um, subsequently. Um, uh, I remember Chris Roy on that occasion, um, who was larger than life in more ways than one, as we all know. Um, and I remember him speaking French with such a broad accent that even I could understand what he was saying. Uh, and I've always had difficulty following people when they speak French um, too, too fast. And then uh, very interestingly on the occasion that I was there um, in the mid nineties, Vicky Rovine was working at the museum, but she wasn't present. Uh, she has subsequently become a, a very close friend um, and colleague. Um, and then of course, um, Henry as well. And what I think for me is very significant is there is not, not only Bill's connection to Southern Africa and uh, South Africa, and Zimbabwe in particular, but all of those people in one way or another, some have, all of them have been here. Some have been here as guests of, of mine. Some have come here to do uh, quite major work uh, in South Africa. I think for example, about the work that Vicky of course has done um, on uh, the fashion industry in South Africa and the several major projects that Bill has spearheaded um, on, on Southern Africa. So still going through my uh, bookshelves, I came across the 1997 Zimbabwe Legacies of Stone, which of course is an especially huge achievement, Bill. Um, such a major uh, exhibition, such a wonderful um, catalog, uh, two volume catalog. I've got them all here in front of me. Um, having looked through all of them again um, today. Um, for that particular um, exhibition, incidentally, Bill, I don't know if you'll remember this, but you asked me to assist you with uh, liaising with Barbara Tyrrell uh, to get some of the watercolors that you included um, on her, on, by her on, on the exhibition. And I'm embarrassed to say that it was because of this that I first actually met Barbara for the first time. Of course, I was aware of her work. I was aware of, uh, to some extent, her importance, um, but I had never actually met her. And I met her here in Cape Town, in Musenberg, where she had a house uh, in order to, as I remember, deliver some uh, watercolors back to her. 
Um, and the, those watercolors included, of course, in the, in the catalogs. And she's such an important figure that I was thinking today, in fact, I've been thinking for about six months on and off, that her remarkable legacy really, really needs to be unpacked. Um, and I'm looking for collaborators to, to assist with a project like that. So if there's anybody out there who would be interested, I, I, I think it's really um, would be a worthwhile thing. Um, and then Bill, do you remember us walking on the pipe track in Cape Town with Else as you were preparing that um, exhibition in the lead up to that exhibition on Zimbabwe and us coming across an earlock that it somehow found its way to Camps Bay after crossing the mountains from uh, escaping from the, the Cape Nature um, Reserve. It was an extraordinary sight and an extraordinary experience to, to, to see that Ilant um, in, in the wrong part, as it were, of the, the peninsula. And uh, further, Bill, in terms of uh, personal anecdotes, um, it strikes me that when we speak about scholarship, we tend to focus very formally on the written word, as it were, and not on the day-to-day -day life experiences. And for me, today really uh, thinking about yesterday and today really thinking about um, us getting together like this is just how much, as I said, on the one hand, we're a family uh, of scholars. And on the other hand, we all have these extraordinary anecdotes uh, about fieldwork. Bill, I remember, and I hope I'm still correct in ascribing this to you, uh, your Land Rover broken down, breaking down and the only way you could get out was to reverse out. Um, I have a similar experience in Tanzania where a radiator packed up and the driver said, we need some tea to put into the radiator. And I thought, tea? Good heavens. He says, yes, it'll seal the radiator temporarily. And I offered him some green tea and he looked at me like I was mad because the only thing that would work would be black tea, not, not green tea. So um, I, I just feel that those memories and those experiences, they don't form part of what we write about. And sometimes I wonder whether they shouldn't actually form part of, of what we um, write about. Um, I want to say finally that um, I have a lament uh, and it has to do with field work. And my lament is this, that there has been this massive shift in interest uh, to the urban away from the rural, away from the traditionalist. And that is quite understandable in, in some respects. Uh, but I do feel that those amongst us, and Bill, you are a major figure as far as that is concerned, who has had the courage to persevere under very difficult circumstances sometimes, to be out in the field, to wait for days, uh, to have broken down vehicles, to have extraordinary memorable experiences, some of them which are very taxing. Um, I think it's remarkable and that there are still people who are really doing important field work. And Bill, I'm saying that partly because I hope though you're retiring, you're retiring now, you'll be back in Africa and you'll be back in the field as part of your future career. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I, I just want to note that Sandra and, and I met when we were both graduate students, That's and there was a, a seminar at uh, at Vitz. Um, we we sat down and compared notes of what we were intending to um, study and to um, to do. Um, yeah. So kind of full circle, but yes, post COVID, I do in, intend to come back to Africa. Thank you again. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Clapper. I now invite Professor Dele Jagade, uh, former professor of uh, Miami University, art historian, artist, art critic, to say a few words, Professor. Well, thank you for inviting me to say one or two things about Bill. Um, let me start with uh, some observation. When I looked at the um, the poster that was sent, and I saw my friend in Agbada and and Fila, 
a Yoruba uh, kind of uh, thing. I was, you know, I said, yeah, this this is Bill. And that right there actually answers to you the stuff of which Bill Dewey is made. Um, the more um, I've heard from uh, those who have spoken before me, the more convinced I have become that yes, Bill is indeed an African. And I say that with, um, with the confidence that I can muster um, because Bill and, and I, we, we go back uh, to the 80s. Um, I've heard the preliminary uh, remarks about the way that Bill got introduced to Africa uh, was in Rhodesia, what was then Rhodesia uh, with Ian Smith and all of that. And, and he had uh, to be segregated. That was the thing that I found quite uh, striking about um, his up upbringing. Here, um, his parents were teaching in a black community and he had to go to high school um, in, in a wide, wide, um, you know, uh, community. Uh, but you said also, uh, Cheryl, for example, and, and Simpri have uh, referred to the connections uh, um, that Bill had, had with um, Zimbabwe, but also um, the one that actually interested me most was uh, Nigeria, his connection with Nigeria. Um, and you are all aware probably that he was at the University of Lagos, uh, Unilag, uh, which is one of the major institutions in Nigeria. It, it, when he was at, at the University of Lagos uh, during his junior uh, year at the University of Minnesota, uh, as he traveled abroad, I would say a student, um, there were only about six universities in Nigeria as a whole. So um, unlike now, when, where you have about 140 universities, you know, private and, and um, public, uh, which are not any better than they were, some of you may know, than in 1973, 74, they actually have gone worse. And I'm generalizing there are a few of them that are good. And he was at the University of Lagos and instantly he was conscripted to the basketball team. There was no way he was gonna avoid that. There was no American this tall that I would claim that he did not know how to play basketball. And that's part of the stereotypes uh, that really uh, Bill has had to, to navigate. And um, he complied. And the result was that he was able to travel to Nigeria, to the University of Nigeria in Suka uh, for what was then known as Nuga Games, the, the National University's game, um, and had fun. Had fun doing all of that. He was able to travel Nigeria to be there, uh, to Abuja when um, there wasn't much in Abuja. Uh, Ladi Kwali, except Ladi Kwali, um, and also uh, experienced the other side of policing, the Nigeria police, uh, which interested me because when he was there, happily, the police descended on the University of Lagos and shut the whole place down, and everybody was sent home. And Bill had to find a refuge with one Professor Warren, you said. Uh, who was living in Ikoyi. And he said also that there was only one uh, bridge connecting Lagos to the island, to the mainland. So that tells you about periodizing. But when uh, in 1973, he was in Lagos, he also was interested not only in college life, but also in the popular culture. He soaked in um, the newspaper, for example, uh, industry. There was a newspaper uh, called um, Lagos Weekend, which was very irreverent and, and also 
women and all that. He, he got into that and particularly uh, there was this columnist who used to write about walkabouts, uh, about uh, a guy who does nothing but eavesdrop and, and walks all over Lagos. So it must have had fun. But I, I come to this with um, convergences and divergences. Uh, Bill, by the time Bill was in, in uh, Lagos, at the University of Lagos, I had just finished my uh, first degree and had just been shipped to uh, Meduguri in what is now Boko Haram, uh, base in, in the Northeast that time in Borno State now as a member of the National Youth Service Corps, pioneer member. And I was thinking, uh, did Bill actually see some of my cartoons in the Lagos weekend? Because I was sending cartoons to uh, Lagos weekend from uh, my base in um, Medupri. But we came together, Bill and I, in Bloomington. And that was the, the major area the, of, of our connection. Uh, when I arrived in uh, Bloomington in 1979, I arrived as a graduate student uh, from the University of Lagos, where I was faculty member and arrived with my, um, my only wife. I had one wife, I've had only one wife since. Um, and our daughter, and uh, I was shocked. I was shocked getting into this country. Is this America? This was my first time. And because it, it was very quiet, everything was, was annoyingly quiet. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't make any uh, head of it. Here I was from Lagos, the turbulence, um, the struggle, and all of those things that gradually I got used to it. And then the following year, 1980, Bill arrived. Yeah, uh, there was Michael Connor, um, Barbara Frank was there, uh, and there was also Diane, uh, Diane Pellerin, and um, Mary Jo was there, uh, Martha Anderson, these are people who were, uh, who were you know, contemporaries. And then I realized that Roy Sieber was the connection. And honestly, the more I listened to, you know, the few speakers talk about Bill, the more I see Bill as, in a way, reading of Roy Sieber. Um, uh, in 2003, Bill invited me to University of Tennessee. And in fact, uh, we brainstormed and the title of the exhibition, uh, World Moves We Follow, was as a result of my discussion with Bill, Ayin Law Anto, uh, the idea that the world is not linear that yeah and there is this essence of collaboration which are the two things that actually continue to recur uh in the work of bill and uh, you can see and um, the major exhibitions that uh, he has created um and he reminds me, as I've said, of, of Roy Sieber, um, very generous. As uh, graduate students, um, he would invite people, invite major uh, you know, speakers, uh, Bill Fagg and all of those people uh, to speak. And at home in the evening, we were, we were there. And gradually we were broken into what exactly it meant to be a graduate student. Um, and uh, listening to what, what others have said, uh, I think it is incontestable uh, that Bill's travels to South Africa, to uh, you know, Zimbabwe, uh, to Nigeria, and of course now in the course of his work, 
uh, the rest of Africa have actually uh, exerted cons considerable uh, impact pool on the direction that his career has taken. Um, in his own words, uh, he shared with me a few anecdotes uh, and you will permit me to br briefly read uh, a few of, uh, of these. I studied the African history, African culture, and some Yoruba language. But of course, in those days, uh, there was no art or art history. And um, he went on to talk about Epoe, you're inviting him when he was uh, in Lagos uh, to visit him because he introduced uh, himself, that is Bill, to Epoe. Uh, during uh, one of the lectures that Epoeyo gave to the general African studies uh, class, which he had to take, they called it uh, jazz, uh, typical, you know, Unilad students. And that was how he got his uh, break, quote unquote, because what he did at, at um, the museum in Lagos, arranging a Don Ogboni ultimately became um, the basis for his masters with uh, Frank Quillet when he was in Northwest and later. Um, from there, uh, uh, moved to Bloom Bloom Bloomington. And uh, in a way, I can say that uh, Bill's uh, life up to that point, that my story also would constitute the first side of the coin, the same coin. Because as he was uh, in Nigeria and then coming back, I now um, was arriving in the US. And uh, in, in that regard, Bill, uh, there were quite a number of things that uh, we struck off very, very beautifully. The fact that he had been to Lagos, oh wow, this is this graduate student, uh, this white guy who has been to Lagos, I mean, that was as close as you could get uh, to a Nigerian. And um, when we were in Bloomington, it was a kind of a molding. The, the education that we received from Sieber, um was thorough. To me at that time, as a graduate student, um, all of the things I was learning through Sibur and, and the books were things that were in a way strange to me, learning about Africa, learning about uh, myself, was it th was, these were things that, are, that were strange to me and also at the same time familiar to, to learn that I would have to, to see that I would have to come to the US to learn about myself. That was the revelation that things were codified, articulated, that I knew about because I lived much of that, but was not able to categorize them, compartmentalize them in ways that art historians have done. That was a revelation to me. And we went, of course, through the whole gamut of uh, all the slides and um, all of that. And then, um, I would say when in talking about Bill, that in fact, his contributions uh, to African art history are quite clear, quite strong. And it is not possible uh, um, this, this short kind of uh, uh, time and forum uh, to expand on them, but I've broken uh, that down into two major areas. Um, his curatorial work and his scholarship. He has been, I would say, infatuated with Ogun. That is the Yoruba word for iron. Ogun is the god of iron among the Yoruba. Ogun is a very formidable pathfinder. Um, every iron implement uh, is, of course, Ogun's uh, work. 
And so to the extent that you can understand this among farmers uh, that use what well, machetes and all of that, um, you use uh, machete to clear the path and uh, the metaphor of Fogun, uh, um, a, pie, a path and find that becomes quite relevant in the uh, case particularly of Bill. Um, and so when you look at the work, the, total, the totality of Bill's work, you realize that uh, Bill has actually grown tremendously uh, building on the knowledge that he has drawn from others at the same time, his own experience, his own personal experience being in several of these places that uh, his work uh, pertain to. Uh, particularly of the Yoruba, you permit me to read a brief uh, poetry uh, that signifies the, the way the Yoruba uh, hold the, the high esteem in which the Yoruba hold Ogun. Meji Logun, there are seven brands of Ogun. Ogun Alara Ningbaja, Alara's Ogun consumes dog. Ogun Onire Agbagbo, Onire's Ogun is giving a ram. Ogun Nikola Nigbagbi, Onikola's Ogun is giving a snail. Onikola, by the way, um, those who perform circumcision. Elemona, Agbesun Ishu. Elemona's Ogun is given roasted yam. Akin's Ogun is given. Um, Ogun Akinu Nigba Wagbo. Akinu's Ogun is given a ram's um, horn. Ogun Bena Bena, a ram nige. The Kaba's Ogun consumes uh, tortoise. Ibel Ogun Makinde Ti Dogun Len Yodi, whereupon Ogun Makinde became deity at large. That is the uh, short poetry about Ogun. Um, and I would say at this point that uh, generally it is not, um, it, it, there is no contradiction in, in affirming that Bill Dewey is an honorary, honorary African. He is an African, I wouldn't say he's an Africanist in the general sense that we understand that word. Uh, and uh, his legacy will be celebrated through his prodigious academic work. Uh, and uh, the, the work that, as I've indicated, that can be uh, split into, into uh, the two areas of uh, curatorial work and scholarship um, in volumes and exhibition catalogs chapters in books, articles, catalog entries, reviews, videos and dictionary entries covering diverse spectrums on African material culture, ranging from, and this is one of the titles uh, of his uh, essays that I found quite uh, attractive, AK-47 for the ancestors. Uh, to Shona ritual axes, um, iron sculpture in Africa to blacksmiths and kings and their work in iron, Bill continues to interrogate the significance of iron to the numerous sculpture and through that has contributed substantially to the task of edifying the genius of the African creative. Uh, regarding his uh, curatorial work, um, I would say that that spans the continent, ranging from the 1994 Ion Master of Them All, uh, which he co-curated with uh, Alan Roberts, uh, to the most recent blockbusters, African Brilliance, a diplomat uh, 60 years of connecting, collecting uh, at the Palmer Museum of Art, uh, to the traveling exhibition 
striking eye on the art of African blacksmiths, uh, both of which opened in 2010. On striking iron, here is how Holland Cotter, the New York Times Pulitzer uh, Prize winning author, uh, art critic, uh, his views. And I quote, striking iron at the Paola Museum is the most beautiful sculpture show in recent memory. And furthermore, he affirms that is Cotter that striking iron is a characteristic product, unfamiliar material, passionately researched and utterly gorgeous, end quote. Furthermore, he says, the show opens with an expansive picture of iron uh, as an essential cosmic matter. It's, the art, it's in the earth soil, in the human bloodstream and courses through sub-Saharan African history. Um, so, Kura's, um review of the exhibit, you cannot get anything that is much uh, more substantial. Um, and generally, I would say that Bill's body of work highlights the importance of some key issues. And apart from the fact that uh, we've been together for God knows how many years, and we continue to, uh, you know, to be uh, friends and, and family with uh, Barbara and all of that, I would say that um, one of the critical elements that um, has characterized Bill's work is um, the significance of collaboration, that a tree does not make a forest. Um, the success of his numerous exhibitions uh, demonstrates the importance of collaborative, uh, collaborative scholarship. Um, the exhibit, for example, the two major exhibits that I just uh, alluded to, uh, which were, uh, were um, oh, which opened in 2019, um, could not have been possible without the, the collaboration of others. Of course, the other one uh, he did by himself at the um, the uh, University of uh, the Penn State University. Um, the argument then becomes quite uh, important for us here to look at. And I probably would itemize this and hope that we would have time later on to talk about them. Uh, the ethics of collecting African art who collects and how is the collection or the collecting done? Um, can we actually say that all of the works, the items that we exhibit and term collecting uh, collections, but they actually collected? Those are the issues that I would want us to look at. And um, I would say that by and large, through such major exhibits, um, scholars, including uh, Bill, have continued to expand our understanding of uh, the significance of African culture. Uh, and um, we also uh, have seen that the arts are uh, the physical manifestations of very abstract uh, and, and uh, fugitive notions that without the physicality that the arts uh, present, we may not be able to debunk some of the um, racist assertions that prevail, uh, you know, at least that, that we see in the literature. Uh, and now that you are retiring to Bill, um, it is very important for you to hold uh, to the notion that you actually have not retired. It's another chapter as you move as you move forward, uh, it simply means that you have opportunities to roam free and roam wide without the inhibitions of having to answer to a particular uh, institutional kind of norms. And um, I'll be able to uh, contribute as, as we move forward. And I congratulate you and, and uh, Barb and William uh, and wish you the best as you move forward. Thank you.
Yale, I want to say um, thank you. Um, Osheo, Kupo, uh, one of the connections that Dele didn't mention was when I first came to Indiana University at Bloomington, Dele was my Yoruba teacher. And I then switched, <laughs> I then switched to doing um, Southern, Southern Africa. But when I started, I thought I was going to go back to uh, Nigeria. The other interesting connection is that I was um, at one point, I forget the, the year, I was the, the president of, of ACASA. Um, Dele was my successor. And we had the good fortune of uh, both going to New Orleans to um, plan the, the triennial um, and had a lot of good fun, fun with, uh, with Bill Fagley there in getting started of that, uh, that uh, uh, triennial. Um, Bill Fagley just has a biography out for those of you that uh, know him, The Nightcrawler King. So uh, a new book um, that tells his, uh, his story. Um, say hello to Joke and Ronke. They, they're the ones that I, I know, the, know the best. Yeah. Ronke was a little yeah. girl when we went to Bloomington um, and now right. a grown, grown woman. So Osheo Popo. Also, I, I do remember your cartoons. When I was a student at Unilag, um, in, a, in addition to Walkabout, um, I also looked for your cartoons. So that was our connection before we even knew each other. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, thank you, Professor Jagade. I now invite Janet Purdy, Rice Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow in African Art, uh, Art Institute of Chicago, Janet. Janet, you're muted. Uh, Janet? Oh, we are yes. having a small technical uh, problem. I think she's gonna kind of log in again. Uh, perhaps we can take a moment to kind of, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, the Akasa community and the art historians who have, the African art historians who are joining us and maybe when Janet joins us, we can go back to Janet. And if any of you want to share um, some words before Janet joins, this will be probably we can use the time. Anyone from the audience would like to say anything? I'd like to just greet Bill and congratulate him. I hadn't realized it was until 1980 that you reached Bloomington because it seemed to me you were a much bigger part of my time at Bloomington and that was my last year in residence. So um, I just wanted to say, I know Janet is going to say something like this. So I'm going to preempt her. Uh, when I first saw Bill, who he reminded me forcibly of was Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones. Not to, not to say that that was his collecting policy or anything like that, but uh, that was my, my first impression. And it was fun for me to see Dele and Bill and Michael, all of whom had the Nigerian experience that I was dying to have and, and had a couple years later for quite a long time, <laughs> but it was, uh, to, to hear Dele mention Lagos Weekend really brought me back in time and walk about and, and learning Pigeon just from talking to friends at Igamin when I was in the dining hall. So um, a great experience with you, Bill. And, and Bill and I, I feel like Bill is my co-parent because Janet was my master's student. She was his uh, PhD student. And, and I always say that I'm gonna make a genealogical chart of Sieber students and how they crisscross with other lineages because it's really kind of fun to see. But uh, you're, you're right up there. So congrats <laughs> and I, I know it'll be a good time for you. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, and there are also other members from the Casa community. So if any of you want to share anything please do while we try to figure out what is the technical snag with Janet. Can you, am I back yet? Yes, you're wow. back, Good. thank okay. you, yes. So sorry, my power went out. And okay. uh, so my Wi-Fi, and you can see it's still dark, but I just was able to reconnect via wireless. Sorry sure. about that. No, thank you. Yes, Janet, please go ahead, yeah. 
Okay. Did you just introduce me right when the power went out? <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so first, I'd just like to begin by offering my sincere thanks to the African Studies Department for putting this conference together to celebrate the many contributions Bill has made in his prolific career with such a broad reach. And I also thank all of you for taking the time to support and honor Bill today as best we can from points near and far with power or without. Um, I'm just, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm just beginning my second year of a three-year tenure um, as a, a postdoc curatorial fellow in the Arts of Africa at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I was fortunate enough to have Bill as my doctoral advisor for five years, beginning in September, 2015, up until I just finished in this past uh, year, August of 2020. And it's such an honor to be able to say a few words um, in this program today alongside the scholars, the three scholars for whom I have such great respect, Dele, Sandra, and Al, and then also to all of you that are in the audience for, for whom I also have so much respect. I'm going to, um, please forgive me, another kind of technical thing. I, to, to avoid repetition, I'm gonna go off script a little bit. So if I fumble, please forgive me. But um, I'm gonna start by taking us to the Swahili coast. And if I can share my screen, that's where I will start. Okay, can everybody see those pictures of Stonetown Zanzibar? Great. And I began on the Swahili coast because as probably is the case with most of you, I've been on the receiving end of Bill's gentle, persistent, patient encouragement. Uh, and I, I had one of the greatest moments and the smartest moments of my career to listen to him and he, you know, as, as has been mentioned, he was a pioneer in, in researching and spending time in and learning about Eastern and Southern Africa and has created some of the most foundational work upon which all of us stand um, in addition to the work that he's done around the rest of the continent and the world. But East and South Africa, I know have a special place in his heart. And when I came into the program, I was determined to work in Cameroon and again, as, as you've all probably been on the receiving end of, Bill consistently encouraged, mentioned, pointed to East Africa, the Swahili coast. And I learned so much about him as a person and his patience when um, I began to study the Swahili language and was fortunate to be offered the chance to travel with the Critical Language Scholarship Program to Tanzania for two months for cultural immersion and language immersion. And, and I told Bill that I had, oh, I have power again. And I was thinking of turning it down because I was really determined to work in Cameroon and um, I just couldn't afford the time a whole summer and to spend all of the money to invest. And he, he somehow, didn't scream at the phone at me and tell me what an idiot I was being to turn that down. He was very patient. He was, he worked through it. And I'm happy to say in the end, I, I did go to Tanzania and fell in love and fell in love with, with the culture, with the continent of Africa. That was my first way to visit. And it was a spectacular way to visit. And, and life has never been the same for me since. And I've learned to listen to Bill always going forward after that. <laughs> so my dissertation was about carved Swahili doors and my research interests include symbolic imagery and inscription on doorways and thresholds in the Indian Ocean world and the related visual affinities in the Afro-Arab Asian artistic production and exchange. And I'm particularly interested in the transmission of talismanic patterns and designs and their diverse protective functions as they connect across cultures. So I've been thinking for quite some time now about facades and thresholds and exterior versus interior spaces. What we see or think we may see on the surface and that which we cannot see, but may suspect lies behind or beyond or in the spaces between. And I spent a lot of time on the Swahili coast region in these last few years, where a hallmark of architecture is a stark exterior 
with a flat plane surface. This is a distinct visual counterpoint to the tenant that the most important and beautiful features and investments of wealth are held deep in the interior. As one passes from the outside of a Swahili building and moves through to its innermost chambers, ever more elaborate and beautiful details are increasingly revealed. The unassuming facades give no indication of the riches held deep inside. And for me, that's an appropriate metaphor to keep in mind as all of us are speaking about Bill's wealth of gifts. And to be clear, I would never use the word simple or plain to describe Bill, but the word humble seems to apply in both contexts. It aptly describes the unassuming exterior of the Swahili structure. And for all of us who know Bill, behind his humble exterior, beyond his great humility, lies incredible depth, knowledge, character, and integrity. So now I will spend a little bit of time bragging on Bill's behalf in a way he never would himself about how those characteristics have supported his pedagogical contributions in so many tangible and intangible ways. These are centered in my own experiences and observations, of course, as one who's maybe benefited the most heavily and the most directly, but I will do my best to speak also for the other thousands of students, colleagues, and friends around the world on whom he's had such a positive and lasting impact, whose lives he has enriched with education and more, and for all he has meant as an advisor, a scholar, an educator, a mentor, a colleague, and as a person in his academic work. First, I'll talk about the tangible contributions. Bill always likes to point out how much his career has been clustered around the Big Ten, and it really is true. He did his undergraduate work in studio art at Minnesota with an emphasis in sculpture, primarily welding and casting. His master's, as we've heard, at Northwestern with the eminent Frank Willett. His PhD, as we've also heard, with Roy Sieber at Indiana. His dissertation was titled Pleasing the Ancestors, the Traditional Art of the Shona People of Zimbabwe followed later by teaching positions at Iowa and Penn State. That makes five. <laughs> if I've got my math right, Bill taught art history for 10 years at Iowa, 10 years at University of Tennessee, and 10 and a half years at Penn State. But his first teaching position was as a visiting instructor at Ohio University, an opportunity that I, that was so last minute, he was basically creating the course and learning the material a day ahead of teaching it. And I love when he talks about that one because it's so much easier to identify with. <laughs> it seems to be the only time Bill was not able to operate from his usual position of being fully prepared or able to think nimbly on his feet. Bill has received awards from the NEH, Fulbright Hayes and others for research in European museum collections on the ground in, Z in Zimbabwe and many parts of the continent. A Fulbright Scholar Award to study the art of traditional Swazi blacksmiths and wood carvers in what is now Iswatini a Getty funded postdoc at the Center for Materials Research and Archeology span and Ethnology at MIT, uh, as has already been mentioned, the University of Minnesota Exchange Program Scholarship for a year at University of Lagos in Nigeria and many, many more. He's been invited to give lectures all over the world. He has contributed to scores of publications. Some of those have been mentioned today, but the list is just incredibly impressive. He's organized so many global conferences and events created and produced films and has organized a large number of exhibitions, but his greatest strength is, as has already been mentioned, his ability to create community. Bill has brought all of this vast wealth of knowledge and experience into his role as an educator with generosity and humility. He integrated his own photos, films, objects, stories, and experiences into his lectures with incredible modesty but students always realized they were learning from someone who had spent dedicated time and energy out in the world with inquisitive and exploratory work, with those deep connections and time with the very people and cultures and art he was teaching about. Bill's ability to do so, to so easily share that knowledge and contextualize information had value and depth that reaches miles beyond the classroom environments of colleagues who gain their knowledge in archives and museums alone, or who hold a perspective from one country only, especially just the US. Students picked up on that, they valued it, they appreciated it, and they gained insights and remembered what they learned because of it. 
just as important as Bill's excellence as an educator is how he has patiently, generously, humbly, respectfully, and consistently displayed how to be a good person in education. Not only how to be a good teacher, a good advisor. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. You, you froze. I wanted to make sure I wasn't talking to dead air. Uh, a good volunteer invested in service to his field, his university, his department, his organizations, and more. He shows us that it is possible to know one's worth and to add immense value to our field without any need for a blown out ego, bombastic stances, or self-important measures. He has also demonstrated for me time and time again the valuable lesson of to be patient and working around or working with those individuals who do not operate from um, Janet, sorry. Same graceful Janet? and similar position of quiet confidence. Uh, Janet, can you hear me? Uh, uh, Janet, I think we lost Janet. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, sorry, can you hear me again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So really sorry, everybody. Yes, that's okay. Maybe a good way to do is not share the screen because it takes a lot of bandwidth. So. Okay, I just have a few more pictures that I do absolutely have to share. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I won't get kicked out again. And apologies, everybody. Okay. Thanks for your patience. I was talking about Bill's work ethic. Okay, his ability to balance bound downtime, prioritize his family, enjoy cooking, his love of world music, support colleagues and students at their events, and also support Penn State sporting events. Concerts, fundraisers, often joining Barb for her many obligations. Barb has also been an incredible role model and I admire and aspire to her level of commitment, grace, and work ethic too. Penn State struck gold with these two and so many of us have reaped the benefits of all of their contributions. This work ethic and consistent level of production resulted in so many lasting and tangible contri contributions at Penn State. And I'm certain this was the case wherever Bill has been. We've heard a lot of them mentioned in previous talks and I'm just gonna run through a quick list of what I saw him balancing simultaneously. Helping junior faculty negotiate new positions and cross de departmental appointments with African studies writing recommendation letters for department grants, university funding, external funding, postdocs, PhD programs, and teaching positions, advocating for library programs and increase in African and African diaspora resources, the African Studies Undergraduate Research Exhibition, the African Studies Caucus, attending lectures and gallery talks, as his work as the interim head for African Studies and Africana Research Center, and working to develop collaborations and growth of those programs as a board member for the Palmer Museum of Art, actively and patiently advocating for years the need to increase the collection of and highlight more broadly the arts from Africa. Promotion and cultivation of language programs, especially Swahili, a consultant for the Palmer Museum visiting private collections and potential donors, and of course the African Brilliance Exhibition. I watched Bill work on all of these while at the same time he was teaching, advising me and other graduate students writing for all his publications and working with his collaborators. 
on his, his striking iron exhibition. He did this with such grace, integrity, and good humor. And even though I had a front row seat for a few years, I have not yet figured out how to achieve that balance or that level of production. On the intangible side of things is where I personally rank the greatest reach of Bill's pedagogical contributions. And this is more difficult to express, but it applies most directly to my own experiences. Any of us who spend significant time on the ground in Africa know too well that it takes major commitments in time, passion, care, respect, and understanding to build relationships and knowledge about a place and its people. But once we have invested the time in our hearts and our souls, those who we spend time with know they have our support, friendship, and respect, and they give it back in return. And Bill has this in spades. This kind of knowledge building and relationship building is so important because it operates and adds value in both directions. The benefits of these contributions, contributions reach far beyond pedagogy, for they teach more of us how to become better global citizens and how to support integrated global education more broadly. It is in these intangible ways that we may see the global impact of Bill's contributions, for the world really is becoming smaller and more interconnected all the time. As that happens, the seeds of Bill's work and efforts are continuing to grow and spread out into the world in the very same way he harnessed and brought aspects of the world into his educational practices and advising. One wonderful example of this I can share with you happened when I was in Bagamoyo, Tanzania to present a paper for the first time at an international conference. And one day I sat down next to this gentleman, Pascal Taravinga, who was working at the Robben Island World Heritage Site and also at University of Cape Town. He mentioned that he came from Zimbabwe and I told him that all I knew about Zimbabwe was from my advisor, Bill Dewey. And Pascal told me that when he was a young boy, Bill had visited his small Shona village during his research travels and was so excited to tell me about how much they had all cherished their time with Bill what a lasting impression he had made on so many of them and how he had pursued his education as a result. I was the only art historian in the group of archeologists, engineers, and heritage experts, but that was also some of the best advice Bill gave me early on to make connections across disciplines, especially with archeologists. And that experience led to some of my best friendships in the international collaborations that I'm working on. I've seen and heard firsthand from Bill's African family, friends, and collaborators, how very much they respect and admire and value him. And we've heard some of those comments today. As just one example, Chaz Navion Davis, Davies, a Zimbabwean graphic designer and activist told me, Bill just gets it. He gets us as Africans and in fact, truly is one of us. And it's a wonderful testament to the contributions through relationships and respect that Bill has built with so many. I know he feels the kinship too. Bill emailed these photos from his days on the basketball team at Lagos. He recently came across them. He was cleaning out his office in the art history department. When he sent them, he wrote, see if you can tell which one is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so fun to see these tracksuits and to have this spectacular sartorial glimpse from the 1970s Nigeria. It also underscores for me how many immersive and informative experiences Bill has had with friends family and communities around the continent and around the world. And I return to my earlier comments about exterior and facades. We can joke about how Bill sticks out here, but we know how outward appearances don't always reflect fully what is going on inside, other riches and connections we have built there. I hope you don't mind me sharing then that it's therefore one of my greatest honors and most meaningful compliments in following Bill's lead when my friends in Zanzibar introduce me to visitors or to their families, and they say, she is a Swahili Zanzibari just like us. Don't pay attention to how she looks. Listen to her speak our language and see it in her heart. These photos side by side mean a lot to me because they are both taken on Pemba Island in Zanzibar in places still not easy to get to, but so worth it. On the left is Bill visiting the father of one of his closest Tanzanian friends. On the right, see if you can tell which one is me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working with my, Zan I'm with, with my Zanzibari friend Safe on the left. He took me to his parents' farm to meet his family, including from left, his mother, his sister, his grandmother, and his auntie. Bill, I'm incredibly fortunate and grateful to have had you as my advisor and mentor, and now I think I can call you my friender. You are mm -hmm. such a rare gem, and I know few people can make the claim to such a supportive and positive PhD experience 
based in integrity, breadth of knowledge, and actually a lot of fun. As I carry forward in my own work, I do my best to follow the example you have set to honor all your generous contributions toward my education and toward that of so many others, and to show you as you now enjoy your well-deserved and happy retirement, that those contributions will not only endure, but will continue to grow and multiply in their impact as they expand outward and into the future. Thank you. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jana, that was great. Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, could you just stop sharing the screen? Thank you. I now, in, thank you. I now invite Professor Alan Roberts, Distinguished Professor, UCLA Department of World Arts and Cultures. And Al is my former mentor, advisor, and also oh, yeah. a phenomenal That's human being. So, Al? Hello, everybody. It's really great to see uh, a lot of old friends. And I just uh, hasten to say that that's not necessarily an ageist uh, comment right there. Uh, I'd like to sort of start with my surprise uh, with Cheryl's very first uh, revelation, actually, that, um, you know, Bill was on the basketball team and we saw him dressed up like a uh, giraffe with all these other people and whatever but that he actually didn't play. And that just somehow runs against the uh, stories I've heard from him for years as his having been the Larry Bird of uh, Nigeria and all things. <laughs> like just like to also <clears throat> thank Bill for having uh, this morning anyway, um, spared us uh, from the agonies of seeing one of his bow ties. <laughs> you know, these are little gifts. <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, I've had the joy and privilege to be great friends with Bill, Barb, and William Dewey from just about the day they arrived <clears throat> in Iowa City in 1990. My late wife, Mary, and I had moved there in 1988 when Mary was named director of the University of Iowa Museum of Art and when she sadly succumbed to a brain tumor in 1990, when she was only 41 and our son Seth was seven months old, the Deweys provided shoulders to lean on and much more, including caring for Seth so that I could attend a conference or two. <clears throat> Seth still re remembers uh, with some trepidation uh, Uncle Biu's uh, judicious application of the tickle tool as a toy gently poked in Seth's ribs as necessary. And Bill and Barb remain unofficial godparents to uh, my two sons, Seth and uh, Sid. At Iowa, Bill and I joined the late Chris Roy as scholars of African arts, and we three musketeers soon cooked up all sorts of fun stuff, including the seventh triennial, triennial symposium on African arts in 1992, uh, with an attendance of 600 scholars and others uh, to our sessions in Iowa City. Some years later, as Bill uh, mentioned, and I'm pretty sure that he uh, was uh, president of ACASA in 1997 or so, uh, he would go on and lead that organization that is still responsible for the triennials. Uh, for the, the triennial in Iowa City, one of Bill's uh, real uh, remarkable accomplishments was to work with Merrick Posnanski and write a, a grant to bring 14 African scholars to the United States to participate in the triennial, but also to uh, stop off and do some other university-based things across the United States. And as just about everybody uh, this morning has said, uh, Bill's invariable inclusion of African colleagues in his scholarly activities may be the signal accomplishment of his long career as Dele and other, uh, others of us have said, and as Janet just said, uh, his strength in creating community is just stellar. In 1993, Bill curated a landmark exhibition called The Art of East Africa for the Uni University of Iowa Museum of Art at a time when lack of feet on the ground and collections research left many so-called experts feeling there was no such thing as art of East Africa. That same year, Bill and I organized the most memorable small conference and exhibition at the University Museum called Iron Master of Them All. We were able to convene a dozen scholars from around the world and the results were compelling as for instance, when Bill worked 
with colleagues and students in the School of Art and Art History to reconstruct an iron smelting furnace along the lines of the Shona ones that Bill had studied in Zimbabwe and that, uh, of which Janet just showed us a uh, photograph of Bill's. Local iron, ore, <coughs> local iron ore was gathered as was firewood for the furnace that was sculpted uh, as we saw as a woman's torso and that uh, there was absolutely no success whatsoever in smelting iron was hardly the point because uh, the students staying up all night to feed the uh, furnace fire and drink untold amounts of beer was really uh, the sort of purpose of the event anyway. Bill and I hoped that our activities and scholarly networks of people interested in iron arts of Africa would be the platform for a far larger exhibition and program of studies, perhaps sponsored by the Smithsonian. But alas, despite years of trying, it was not until around 2015 that the initiative took root at the UCLA Fowler Museum through an exhibition that's been mentioned several times, uh, Striking Iron, the Art of African Blacksmiths. <clears throat> Bill and I were among <clears throat> principal curators, authors, editors, cooks, and bottle washers as the exhibition opened at the Fowler in 2018 <clears throat> and then traveled to the National Museum of African Art and the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris <clears throat> where it was COVID closed last summer. Another great thing happened in 1993, again with Bill and Barb's encouragement. After some Seth and I had batched it for three years, Polly Nutter Roberts and I got together in 1993, memorably through a great picnic at the Dewey's home in Iowa City. At the time, Polly was senior curator at the Museum for African Art in Manhattan and teaching African art histories at Columbia. <clears throat> I had a sabbatical in spring 1994 and Seth and I spent the term in New York with Polly. She became an instant mom to Seth and Bill, Barb, and William attended our wedding in Santa Fe that summer. When Polly moved to Iowa City in fall 1994, she joined Bill, Chris Roy, and me as the fourth scholar of African arts with whom a coterie of truly wonderful grad students worked. The lasting friendships that Bill and the rest of us developed extends to terrific scholars and curators now out and about in the world, including uh, some of you who have tuned in to celebrate uh, our friend Bill today. Bill was responsible for and contributed to other great exhibitions in the 1990s that have been mentioned already. Based upon his Congolese uh, postdoctoral research in the late 1980s and the unusual one foot in art history, the other in archeology span approach that has made Bill's scholarly contributions so significant over the years, he co-authored and otherwise assisted the prize-winning exhibition and book program, Memory, Luba Art and the Making of History, sponsored by the Museum for African Art in New York. Because of his broad understanding of African arts and graduate work at Indiana on African furniture and other less acknowledged African creations with his graduate mentor, the late great Roy Sieber, Bill guest curated Sleeping Beauties as a first of the kind exhibition of African headrests at the UCLA Fowler Museum, as uh, Sandra Klopper also mentioned. <clears throat> what she didn't say was that uh, uh, the Sleeping Beauties uh, has foreshadowed Bill's uh, predilection for taking naps these days. <laughs> Significant among his project, projects during the 1990s though was Legacies of Stone, which has been mentioned several times. Uh, Bill organized it for Belgium's Royal Museum for a Central Africa and a major book accompanied the exhibition again with Bill's immediate and central inclusion of Zimbabwean scholars that uh, has increased the project's ongoing impacts. It would have been an important, an important uh, project generally because the topic was uh, not very well known outside of Zimbabwe at the time, but uh, Bill's work, the collaborative work, uh, has set a model for everyone. Bill's attachment to Zimbabwe has been due to his years of growing up there that have been mentioned, and uh, the real value, the inestimable, inestimable value of his warm friendships was made manifest yet again in his inviting the esteemed Zimbabwean archaeologist Shadrach Chirukure to participate in the Striking Iron Exhibition and Book Project, and what a difference Bill and Shadrach made to that complex initiative. I could continue, for Bill has contributed to African art histories in so many more ways over the years with exhibitions that have been mentioned already, The World Moves We Follow, 
El Color de la Diaspora that was based upon his innovative research with Afro-Ecuadorian communities that I don't think has been mentioned so far. Uh, and most recently, his uh, African Brilliance uh, exhibition at the Palmer Museum of Penn State. He's led African studies programs, visited African diaspora communities in India, barbecued jerk chicken for untold numbers of aficionados, shared his Aunt Kay's secret pecan pie recipe with a very few, <laughs> shared also his Afro pop cl classic uh, collection, replaced a broken fan belt with a Belgian nun's lingerie in the Congo. There's one. Recycled his Christmas trees with close friends. And best of all, he's been a wonderful son, husband, dad, and friend. And this lasts to so many around the world. Thanks, Uncle Biu. And I just want to make one last little uh, revelation here because, you know, one of the pictures that Janet put up there uh, does really sort of presage where Bill will take his career now that he's going to retire because I do think that there's a rickshaw waiting for him to drag around in Durban and wear horns and, uh, you know, sort of port <laughs> on the uh, sidewalk there. So thanks, Bill. <laughs> thanks, Al. Uh, the, the Durban rickshaw, I had to talk the, the driver into letting me switch places uh, with him but it uh, resulted in a great series of photographs. <laughs> so. Well, thank you, Al. And maybe Bill, you want to say a few words and then we can, you know, as the um, community has joined us to say a few words. <laughs> sure. Um, because this was sponsored by African Studies, um, I want to say, you know, a, a few words about uh, uh, African Studies. So my whole career, it's been you know, quite a trip and a lot of fun, um, but I, I do wanna say some thank yous to um, African Studies. So especially the, the staff, um, Jamie, Whitehead, Jackie Cowley, Ashley, Scott, Melissa Hummel, who was uh, followed after Mary Kilcoin be, before, and then who I didn't work with, but uh, also helped on, on organizing this, Joey. So thanks to all, all of those. The, the other kind of list of people I'll go through quickly, but uh, in African studies, there is another group of uh, grad students um, that I had the privilege of working with. Um, I noticed now that there's a lot more, so that's, that's great. Um, the ones that I worked with were, with were Tembi, Charles, uh, Der Gideon, uh, Vue Touré, um, and then some others that have, uh, that have left. Faculty, I think um, uh, among my, you know, what? Special kind of uh, pride is the new people, the new faculty that I, that I brought, uh, brought in. Um, some of them share homes in other, other departments, but I'll still claim them anyway. Um, Abigail, uh, Celis, Nalima, um, you, you started when I, when I was, was there, um, Chris Townsell, um, believe it or not, uh, African studies didn't have an African historian until Chris, Chris came, um, Michelle Sykes, second, second one that, uh, that joined, uh, some that have left, Julie Kleinman, um, Issei, you know, um, and, uh, Sophia, Sophia, uh, Balakian. And then the last thing that, that, I, that I just wanted to, to, to note, when I was the, the director there, there were a lot of babies born. <laughs> Alicia Decker ha had one, um, Richard uh, had, Richard and Bay had one, Chris and Tamika Townsell had one, um, the indomitable Cairo, uh, Sophia ha had, had one, Broad one had one, and now has had uh, another one. So if you count them up, that's five. <laughs> five, five babies that, that came when, when I was supposed to be the interim director, but it lasted for three and a half, three and a half uh, years. Um, and then just finally, my last words, um, of course, I have to thank my family. Um, as Sandra said, both extended and uh, nuclear um, family, and I have a lot of family in, um, in Africa um, still but my parents who brought me to, um, to Africa, 
Um, and last but not least, uh, my son Will and my wife Barbara, who's been through most all, all, all of it um, on this, uh, this journey. So I'll quit, quit there um, and turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Bill. We have a few more minutes. So if anybody wants to add anything before we all kind of sign off. So if I could. Hey, I think, can, can I, I don't yes, know how please. this. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, yeah. I just want to say that I thought Janet's tribute to Bill was spectacular. And I think it marked something about the quality of him as a person that is extraordinary. And thank you for that. Anyone else would like to share? Um, Chris? Um, yeah, uh, this is Chris Mullen Kramer from African Art. And uh, I wasn't in class with Bill, but I got to know Bill and Barb thanks to the Seber Connections. And it is really so heartwarming to hear all of these accounts and to see so many generations of Seber students and Africanist art historians coming together to celebrate a truly great guy. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, when I got to know Bill and Barb, it was really as colleagues, but also as friends, you know, with a friendship deepening over the years. And what I appreciate is how supportive Bill is to his colleagues and to his students. So we've had a number of his students come through our uh, museum as fellows and interns, and they've gone on to great things, including, uh, you know, L Nalima coming in through UCLA, but ending up, you know, as one of Bill's colleagues. And so it's this wonderful circle of connections that I so appreciate and, uh, you know, that we, you know, got to, to share in. And so it was really a fun event. I was on another call, but honestly, that was just in the background uh, because I couldn't miss any of these presentations because they gave so many different facets to a guy that, you know, I've known for, for decades, but I learned so much more from all of you. So I'm just so grateful that you all pulled together this wonderful event. And Nilima, you were a great sort of master of ceremonies. So well done. And thanks to everybody for sharing because these are the sorts of moments that uplift our spirits and keep us going and remind us why we're in the business and why it matters. And it's because of those human connections that are made throughout a lifetime. And we really saw that coming to the fore here uh, with this testimony to Bill. And I was so glad that Barb was brought into the conversation a number of times because for me, they're like the dynamic duo and they really help uh, you know, each other and our field uh, advance. So thank you for allowing me a moment to sing Bill's praises. Uh, and thanks to all of you for organizing this great event. Thank you, Chris. And I guess Robin at the very beginning said something about Roy Sieber. So you all embody the Siberian kind of pedagogy and, you know, uh, practice. Uh, yes, um, I see Rebecca going up. Yes. Um, so everyone has, I, I've enjoyed this um, um, event so very much. Um, and everyone, I mean, I, I echo everything that everyone has said. <laughs> I've known Bill for um, decades as well in so many different contexts. He visited me in, when I was in Madagascar. We spent time together in Ghana, um, you know, in the States. But one, I have to say that there is one very important part, um, of element of Bill's character that has not been brought up yet. And that's his dancing. <laughs> because every ASA, ACASA, you know, we had our group and we always would dance together. And that was always one of the, the panels were great, I will say, but you know, the dancing <laughs> was a very important part of all of our getting together, you know, and, and, and meeting up and interrupting at the conferences because, you know, and, and that, that was important always, every year. 
So, um, but no, it, it's been such a pleasure, you know, working with you and, and traveling, even when he came to visit in Madagascar, you know, next thing I know, you know, we were looking for, um, you know, iron forges and, <laughs> you know, which were things that, you know, I hadn't been, been working on um, at that point before he came to visit, but, um, but, but really, really, this is fantastic. What a great um, uh, event. So thank you everyone who's been involved. Clement, Thanks. Yes. Sorry. Thanks, Rebecca. I, I just wanted to say that post COVID, yes, let's go dancing again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, Clement, you had something to say? You're muted. Clement, you're muted. Yeah. Um, I was at his uh, uh, farewell um, uh, reception. Uh, so I said a few words there that I may have to repeat, and that's uh, it was. Um, uh, I mean, the, first, the reception for is the part which is a department organized, um, but um, it was I would say it was uh, uh, nice to work with Bill. Well, he was the director for the African Studies, um, and I do remember that uh, one time. He actually made it, uh, uh, went with us to uh, Washington uh, to attend the Model African Union Conference and give uh, a talk there. So it was, it was um, uh, good for us. And uh, as a as, uh, director also, he uh, allocated the funds, funds for, the, um, for the conference. Uh, which uh, has since been a great help. And Cheryl has continued with that, uh, thankfully. <laughs> you, before I used to go around the college uh, with a begging bowl. And, uh, but um, uh, when Bill came in, he changed that. Uh, so thank you for that. And it was also nice and nice hearing everybody talk about uh, uh, his, his uh, person being um, a wonderful person, not just his scholarship or uh, his uh, being from Africa, uh, but as a person. And when you have people talk about you that way, and they couldn't go wrong. Yeah, so thank you very much, Bill. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. Well, all great things have to come to an end, I guess, and this is the best thing we can do. So Cheryl? So I just wanna say thank you all. Um, it has been a, a pleasure um, to host this. I'm only sorry that this um, was a virtual event mm -hmm. and that we couldn't have this in person. And um, I really wish um, Bill well on his retirement as, uh, as so many people have spoken about that this is going to be a whole new season for him. And, you know, this new season will, as he's also said, will also be on the continent. So we look forward to seeing the, a new legacy um, coming from him, okay, instead of a retirement. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yes. thank you all. And thank you, Bill. So we really thank appreciate you. everything that you've done. <laughs> Thank you. In the retirement, maybe I'll get it right the next time. <laughs> well, Thank you, Bill. And thank you, the African Studies community here at Penn State and elsewhere who are beaming in from the continent and also from different parts of the U.S. and also the Akasa community. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful event. And let's all congratulate Bill. We have to give virtual clap and confetti. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all once again. And thank you, Bill and Barb. And thank, thank you, you Cheryl and all the distinguished speakers. Thank you so much for participating in this event organized by the African Studies community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So.